Ariana, I'm live. Dear colleagues, hello. Uh, thank you very much for joining our webinar today, which is organized by Academic Pharmacy Section of uh, FIP under the name Strategies and Activities in the Development of Patient Care Competences in Mental Health for Pharmacy Students and Practitioners. I would like to wish you all good morning, good day or good evening, depends on which part of the world you're coming from. And we were very happy to see many, many colleagues around the world participated as a registrants uh, so far. So we are expecting lots of numbers uh, uh, today online. On our next slide, I would like just to introduce myself shortly. My name is Ariana Mestrovic. I'm coming from Croatia. I'm a vice president of academic pharmacy section and also FIP uh, development hub, global lead for competency development. For many, many years in FIP, I'm active in uh, collaboration uh, with also other sections and uh, entities of FIP. And we are producing many strategic documents, many tools and many different uh, resources that practitioners and also educators can use in their everyday practice in advancing pharmacy profession. I'm also author of the International Pharmaceutical Federation, the FIP Global Competency Framework for educators and trainees in pharmacy, which was launched in September 2022 in FIP Congress in Seville. And today we will emphasize what kind of competences actually educators in pharmacy needs to develop to teach mental health, but also what kind of competences our students need to achieve before they enter to practice. Because obviously mental health is one of the biggest issue of today's um, everyday work. And lots of us are struggling sometimes to finding the right words, the right uh, ways, the right time to open up uh, and to talk about mental health issues. As well, teaching mental health is, uh, I think, a competence itself. And we will talk a lot about today how we can really do it in our everyday life. Next one, please. My co-chair is Dr. Arinola Yoda. I'm very pleased to introduce her. She's a clinical pharmacist and associate professor of clinical pharmacy at the Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Lagos. She is also assistant general secretary and editor-in-chief of the African Pharmaceutical Forum and also executive committee member of the academic pharmacy section, uh, basically in charge for all our webinars. Uh, and I thank you, Arinola, for uh, your presence today and for everything that you're doing in organizing our webinars. Next one, please. A little bit of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded and will be live streamed via YouTube and you will be able to access the uh, uh, recording later. Uh, we will also uh, open up the chat for you. We already, it's open. You may ask questions using the question box provided. Also, uh, it's very nice uh, if you would find the time to provide some feedback about the quality and the usefulness of the webinar to webinars at FIP.org. And if you are, by any case, you're still not a member of FIP, there is a link that you can click and choose among different sections according to your uh, preferences and everyday life setting to become uh, our dear colleague from FIP. Next one, please. It is my also pleasure to introduce the whole team uh, of today, uh, except to co-chairs, you will see uh, the speakers and the panelists. So, so today we are going to spend our time listening to two presentations. Alena will from Croatia will talk a little bit more about 
practice insights about how to develop the competences in uh, developing good mental health for the patients. And Abdi Karim Abdi will talk a little bit more about how to develop competences as educators. And then our panelists will talk a little bit more about challenges and opportunities in implementing those programs uh, according to their own experience. You will see later, uh, they are also, some of them uh, were part of our uh, big projects in academic pharmacy section, uh, also receiving the grants for their projects in uh, keeping the mental health of the students in pharmacy. Of course, we will also have some introduction at the beginning and we will have at the end the closing remarks. Now it is also my pleasure to connect a little bit to today's topic with the workforce development goals. You will see as well here that we have marked number five, nine and 14. Basically what we are talking about today is how to develop competences, but also how to fill responsibilities and build up the new services that pharmacists could develop in the mental health and well-being patient care, because we need to embrace new roles. Our customers, our clients, our patients are having new needs. And as soon as we recognize them, uh, it would be good to act and to provide some help. Also, there are strategies and activities to promote development of the mental health patient care competences among the students, and we will hear more about how to do that. But as well, also as educators, if we have educators today, how to develop our own competences to teach how to develop uh, mental health competences. As well, we will showcase some experiences from our own uh, projects. Now it is my pleasure to introduce you to the first speaker. Alena Tatarovic is a Master of Pharmacy coming as well from Croatia as myself. And uh, I know Alena for many, many years since she was just uh, finishing her diploma and coming to community pharmacy. I was privileged to be her mentor in the first few months. Uh, but later uh, in the forthcoming years, she has developed into wonderful, uh, dedicated uh, and really warm welcome for the patients, a community pharmacist, who is not only providing dispensing, but just uh, uh, very, very dedicated to organize and to teach others how to do public health campaigns, as well as uh, uh, providing the services, uh, not only in the prescription area, but also in the consultation room with the patients. Uh, today, she is a PhD candidate at the University of Rijeka at the Faculty of Medicines. And uh, very soon, hopefully, uh, Alena will be first community pharmacist in our country with a PhD in public health. So we are very excited because she chose, she was uh, choosing the mental health issues as her topic. And she, of course, is uh, every day um, on the right resources. And I'm sure she will uh, try to, and she'll be very successful in try to uh, let you know where to look if you need to know more about mental health competences. Alena, welcome. I know it's your first webinar and I would like to thank you for organizing it and for putting the idea that we have this uh, webinar today. Welcome and enjoy your presentation. Thank you for these kind words. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, happy to be with you all today and thank you for uh, joining us in this event. We can start my slides, thank you. So we know that uh, mental health uh, is a critical aspect on, of overall health and well-being, and uh, it's a very important public health issue, especially when we speak about mental health disorders uh, in uh, relation with their prevalence and uh, morbidity and mortality because they can also have uh, different and uh, very negative effects on a patient's quality of life with different uh, consequences. So a uh, major also problem uh, related to treatment of the mental health is also that uh, we have some knowledge that these uh, mental health uh, uh, healthcare services are often inaccessible, uh, especially in a low and uh, middle income countries. And uh, that can uh, lead to very negative outcomes, uh, not only um, related to the mental health, but also in relation to the physical um, uh, health. So pharmacists are often the first contact for patients asking uh, for help, and uh, they are well placed to be the first healthcare provider who will recognize the, these symptoms of uh, mental distress and potential mental uh, disorder. 
So developing a competency in this field can facilitate engagement of pharmacists in the provision of mental health care services. Next slide, please. So pharmacies can uh, provide uh, different uh, mental health care services uh, with a diff different and multiple uh, roles. At the beginning, we will speak about promotion of the mental health and uh, well-being. Uh, we will speak also about uh, screening and early detection, not only uh, of the new symptoms of the new uh, mental health condition, but also in relation to detection of uh, worsening of ex existing mental uh, disorder. And uh, when we speak about this area, pharmacists can play a very important role in referring patients to uh, other healthcare uh, providers for uh, to ensure proper um, treatment. So counseling, follow-up and support is uh, are also one of the major and important pharmacist uh, roles that can involve uh, pharmacotherapy, but also non-pharmacological um, uh, support. Uh, patients often uh, try to help themselves uh, with self-medication and supplementation. And in this field, uh, pharmacists are um, a very good source to provide uh, safe self-medication and supplementation, but also to educate patients when these approaches are not uh, sufficient. Uh, so when we have uh, patients with uh, psychotropic medicine use, that, then pharmacist roles are uh, provided through psychotropic medicine use optimization with the different uh, interventions. So to secure, uh, or better to say, to ensure a high quality of uh, these services, it's very important that we have um, continuous uh, professional uh, development in place. Next slide, please. So uh, in the field of promotion of uh, mental health and well-being, uh, we have another term which is uh, defined by WHO, mental well-being, and it's described as a state in which an uh, individual can realize their own ability to cope with normal stressors and also to be a productive member of the community. Uh, so many of uh, prevention and promotion strategy, strategies can be uh, used to um, highlight uh, this approach. And these interventions uh, are, um, um, are here to reduce many risk factors like um, social um, distances or unemployment, uh, and also to enhance many pro uh, protective factors and to create supportive uh, environment that foster this uh, positive mental health. Uh, these promotions uh, can be targeted at the, the individual's level or at the specific group's level, or at the end, at the whole uh, population. Next slide, please. So pharmacies can provide valuable support and different uh, activities can be used like a stigma reduction or different methods for reducing stress, uh, very important uh, awareness campaigns. Uh, but it's very important that at the beginning, uh, we have proper assessment of the detected uh, needs in the field of uh, promotion of mental health. Uh, and to uh, use effective and uh, appropriate met methods, uh, but of course to prepare our level of knowledge and skills and also in relation to attitudes and values uh, to have a proper, um, proper use of these uh, activities. Next slide. So, we know that mental disorders uh, manifest with a diversity of signs and symptoms, and uh, it's very important that pharmacies uh, have uh, specific knowledge, skills, and also attitudes and values, which enables them to be able to recognize uh, not only a common symptoms of mental illness, but also the characteristic of specific mental illness, uh, speaking about like emotional and physical aspects. So these type of uh, screening and early detection methods can uh, uh, be very helpful 
for pharmacists to not only provide care, but also to encourage and educate patients for uh, early, early, early intervention in the case of new uh, mental illness or in the case of worsening existing mental illness appearance. Uh, pharmacists can use different types of uh, tools, scales and uh, questionnaires, but it's very important that these uh, methods uh, are validated and that pharmacists can uh, have a structured approach in identifying and uh, also following up uh, patients with signs and symptoms of uh, mental distress. So here we can see different types of screening tools like a patient health questionnaire or a general anxiety disorder questionnaire, um, depressive anxiety stress uh, questionnaire and so on. And also many uh, free online screening tools are uh, available. So these type of tools can be very good uh, way to educate patients and to motivate them to seek further help if we detect uh, level of uh, symptoms that uh, needed to be uh, uh, treated by uh, proper pharmacotherapy. So these type of uh, tools are also a good source uh, in following up because in that way we can also uh, have like objective uh, measure to see uh, how our patients are responding to treatment. A uh, very important field of uh, early detection uh, is uh, suicide prevention or detection of uh, suicide risk and also recognition of uh, individuals with mental health uh, crisis. Next slide. So data from the literature indicates that pharmacies uh, can have different uh, interventions. Uh, that contribute to treat, uh, treatment outcomes uh, in the field of psychotropic medicine use optimization and therapy management. And these type of interventions uh, aim to ensure safe and effective medicine use because uh, they can have uh, very severe side effects. So these interventions uh, can improve uh, patients' adherence and also lead uh, to better treatment outcomes. Uh, these are interventions uh, aim also to contribute to short-term uh, outcomes like uh, therapy response, uh, relapses, and so on, and also to long-term outcomes like um, prevention of hospitalization or mort mortality. Uh, so they try to minimize different negative outcomes of mental illness and to facilitate recovery of uh, mental disorders. At, uh, at the end, um, they aim, aim to have a positive impact on the quality of life and different uh, aspects like emotional or social, social and also economical uh, one. So some of uh, uh, examples of these uh, intervention uh, are medication review, medication use review or, or MTM, medication therapy management. Also, uh, it, uh, identification of different uh, drug-related problems, but these interventions can be also seen uh, in the usage of uh, treatment guidelines in the terms of medicine selection, regimes, or treatment duration, and also in the use of evidence-based recommendations like uh, management of side effects, uh, drugs in, or drug inter, inter, uh, interactions, or potentially inappropriate uh, medication. So all of these interventions can uh, also lead to uh, creation of a patient care plan. Um, and these type of services regarding the psychotropic medicine use optimization are also very, very important when we speak about uh, transition of care in which we can use uh, medication reconciliation to facilitate this uh, transition. So as I said earlier, uh, pharmacists can play an uh, important role in counseling uh, and supporting patients, but uh, not only in, uh, when we speak about pharmacotherapy use, also when we speak about non-pharmacological approaches. 
So one of uh, these type of approaches uh, are contribution to patient education and promotion of uh, mental health literacy, uh, literacy, which is also very important uh, for uh, adherence, proper adherence and for uh, treatment outcomes, but also to give patients um, like self-care advices uh, and advices for changes, for positive changes in the lifestyle with positive impact on uh, mental well-being. Uh, I would also like to highlight on this slide that uh, when uh, we are speaking about these type of approaches, that it's very important to have a destigmatizing way of communication. So it's also very important in this field to uh, develop the uh, needing uh, communication skill uh, when we uh, try to support uh, our patients with mental health uh, issues. Next slide, please. So uh, to encourage uh, and to facilitate uh, expanded provision of mental health care services provided by pharmacies, it's also uh, important to have appropriate educational models and also to increase the availability of these uh, models not only for practitioners, but also starting from academia, so from uh, from starting from pharmacy uh, students. And we know that uh, to obtain this high level of knowledge uh, and skills, uh, but also attitudes and values, uh, different uh, and variety of teaching and learning methods uh, can be uh, used. So uh, we will speak more on uh, this topic uh, with our next uh, speaker. Thank you so very much, uh, Malena, for this uh, wonderful presentation. In fact, as, I, as you were going through the slides, I'm like, oh, this is my lecture notes that Alina just gave me for this topic. <laughs> so thank you so very much. I will make good use of it, I promise. Thank you. Uh, so going on to the next uh, speaker, we have Dr. Abdi Karim Mohamed Abdi uh, as our second speaker for the day. He's an associate professor in clinical pharmacy and therapeutics and the head of the pharmacy, the clinical pharmacy department and pharmacoeconomics and pharmacoepidemiologic research center of Yedi Tepe University in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, Mabdi is an executive committee member of the FIP academic section. He's also vice director of East African Association for Research and Development. And he has had a leading role in establishing the first drug information and clinical pharmacy center in Northern Cyprus. Please join me as I welcome Dr. Abdi Karim Abdi for his presentation. Thank Go you so much. It. Thank you so much, uh, Arinola. Uh, very nice webinar that I'm sharing with you uh, and Alena and other colleagues. So, uh, so strategies and activities that we uh, adopt in pharmacy curriculum will be will be the topic that I've been talking about today. Uh, as Alena has just mentioned, we need to competence should be uh, developed earlier. In uh, during uh, the development of, of, of our students or development of future pharmacists. So within curriculum, we should assure uh, that we develop competencies earlier, not just uh, we develop um, continuous professional development programs, as Ariana, uh, Alena mentioned, in, uh, for, the, for pharmacies or current practitioners to recap or develop uh, or continuously develop in, their, in the area of mental health but also we need to assure that these are early adopted in curriculum. So today I will talk about uh, our review uh, competence-based education and how does it apply to mental health uh, education. I'll share some features of common programs that are adopted uh, that were used globally to showcase uh, these programs and then uh, to go to the next part of our uh, webinar today, which will be which we which we will discuss with uh, colleagues that have real experience in uh, developing uh, programs for the undergraduate students or for uh, for practitioners in uh, the area of competence uh, of mental health. So uh, when we say competence based education, so we mean uh, an education. It's an education model that's currently uh, game changing in most education health education fields. Uh, it's a it's a model of, of of teaching and learning that assures competent graduates or workforce 
uh, to meet uh, societal needs. So it's an outcome-based education system where the outcomes that we are looking at are, is the competences, the final competences that we want our graduates to uh, have to meet the societal needs. Competency involves knowledge, attitudes, so skills, so not just uh, recalling the foundational fundamental uh, knowledge, but also as well attitudes, skills, and behaviors that are necessary to uh, deliver the surfaces in a proficient way. Uh, when we say competency, uh, when, when, when we use the word competence, so competency doesn't, it, it's not an end stage that we are trying to see from our graduates, but we can say competence in according to um, uh, according to literature, competence is a, is a, is one stage in the continu in the continuum of the, of improving performance. So we have if we, we have uh, we can divide states of development at five. So if you if you start as a beginner in delivering a surface or a, or an advanced beginner, then competence for uh, or till the to become an expert in 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 in, de in, de in delivering a care uh, practice. Competence falls in the middle, so it's a place in the middle between uh, beginner or advanced beginner and being proficient or expert. Competence falls in the middle, so we try to reach this level for our to assure graduates of competency before in in, in an area uh, of practice before they uh, graduate. How do we develop competency in? In, in curriculums, in pharmacy education curriculums, we have many activities that we use to develop uh, competencies. Uh, we have uh, our, the classical, or, or the for, we need formal teaching or didactic uh, courses to or lecturings, interactive lecturings that to share uh, fundamental knowledge or uh, uh, found the foundations of topics that we are. Uh, we want our students to develop competency in. We have also clinical hands-on uh, or preceptor uh, training that or, work or, or workplace training that learning that occurs in the hospitals or uh, in the community pharmacies or in other settings. We have um, interprofessional education. We have uh, case discussions uh, as an as a activity or a method for developing competency in, 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 in clinical fields or, or as well uh, in, in mental health. Uh, we have uh, reflective practices uh, or portfolios such as portfolios that are used or uh, presentations uh, that that can be used for uh, event for developing competency as well uh, simulations simulations get very popular nowadays uh, we have uh, multiple simulation ways that we are uh, or role plays or uh, or, or uh, that we use for developing competency or also assessing formal assessing or summative assessing of, of, uh, of uh, education or competency. Uh, also uh, serious gaming is or serious gaming is one of the uh, emerging uh, 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 activities that are are, are now uh, increasing widely used in pharmacy uh, education. So all this range of activities we use them, or we, we use combination of them to develop competency uh, or uh, as, as, as main tools for uh, competency-based uh, education. The, and the same applies when we go to uh, developing competency in, in mental health. So as, we, as I, I was trying to review literature, uh, all of these, most of these techniques, of these strategies, maybe other than I, I didn't encounter studies show, showing uh, serious gaming in this field. So someone uh, who's interested could uh, try to uh, test this in, in, in research, but all other these other uh, techniques are the main tools or strategies that were activities that were used to develop uh, competency in uh, mental health as we are going to discuss this further in the next slides. So we said outcome-based education or competency-based education. So we, we, we define this as a model of education where we, the set of knowledge attitudes and, and uh, at knowledge attitudes, practices and behaviors are the outcome from the outcome of or the, uh, the, the learning objectives that we are trying to achieve from uh, this program. So in the field of mental health, uh, 
of mental health. So we, surfaces, we, these are the surfaces that pharmacists are practicing currently and supported by evidence showing their benefits. Uh, I think Alena has discussed these uh, in details. These include uh, the prevention of addiction, uh, substance abuse, screening for uh, mental health illnesses, science and recognizing the signs and symptoms, responding to early responding to mental health crisis, uh, suicide uh, prevention, um, collaborative care models where pharmacists share with collaborate with physicians on uh, delivering care in these settings, especially in the settings of transition of care. Uh, also optimizing uh, psychotherapy use and uh, education, all of the of our, and patient education or patient counseling. All these are. Uh, services that pharmacists deliver, as Elena uh, spoke about before, but all these are the outcomes that you, as you, as an as an educator, will be looking at when you are developing a program or or, or when when you are uh, building your or structuring your curriculum. You need to consider all the, a graduate that will be competent in delivering all these uh, services to be competent in mental health care. Um, um, so, so what are these? What, what are the necessary or the f core competences that we need to uh, to to show within curriculum so that we uh, are able to uh, deliver these services? We need there is a set of attitudes, values, beliefs that we that uh, the the learner should expressed so these include uh, maybe anti uh, or uh, stigmatization uh, free uh, healthcare providers you need we need uh, to consider the learner to consider or understand the discrimination uh, that these uh, patients may uh, encounter unbiased uh, an unconscious bias that they may sometimes uh, deliver. Uh, so uh, dignity of these patients, having showing empathy to these patients, all these are set of values and attitudes that we expect the learner to express. Uh, mental health also context or awareness is important. Awareness of the diseases, the epidemiology of diseases. How often these uh, how how often we may encounter uh, mental health uh, disorders, uh, as well uh, the impact that uh, mental health disorders can lead to suicide or the impacts, the negative impacts that they that the, the which uh, all uh, we, we need our. Uh, learner, our practitioners or students to uh, show competency in. Uh, third is to commit uh, to develop self and services. Uh, so uh, self-development in this area is important. Being able to self-develop in this area is important. Managing burn, uh, burnout uh, also and burnout prevention are skills that we need our graduates to learn before or competencies that we need our graduates to learn before how to practice or collaborative care, uh, uh, how to collaborate with other healthcare providers in the field of mental health, uh, therapeutic communication with the patients and the families, communicating for mental health disorders or communicating with patients with mental health disorders is not similar to any other communication. So we need to assure that our graduates are competent in the therapeutic uh, communication with patients, families, as well as healthcare providers. And finally, medication knowledge and management, which is maybe the area that most of our traditional uh, programs were uh, focusing in. Uh, the, or we use pharmacy schools are commonly uh, uh, developing competency in medications knowledge to antipsychotics and their their management their pharmacotherapy uh, workup that they need but uh, but that's not uh, enough for to to show uh, competence in mental health we need all uh, these core uh, competencies to be addressed so um so uh, uh, there, there is a, a systemic uh, it is a systemic review by uh, Crispa Gonzalez and her uh, and their uh, colleagues. The team has reviewed recently uh, in 2022 all the programs that were uh, all literature on uh, programs that were developed for mental health competency development in pharmacy education. So there is up to 20, 23 out of 33 programs that they reviewed that were related with the undergraduate students. 
So if we try to summarize the features of these 23 uh, programs uh, and also some other publications that were done after the systemic review, these courses, mainly the mode of delivery is that they were in some, in some uh, studies, they were compulsory courses. Some others were, they were elective courses or they were uh, carried for the, for the reasons of, of research purpose, but they were not adapted in curriculums so far. Uh, these, Co these programs are uh, are, are delivered uh, in all the uh, years, starting from some of them. They were starting in the first year or the second year. Some of these programs were done in the fifth year or uh, maybe the sixth year. So the range of of, of the, so there is a why we, we have uh, we don't have a certain uh, period that we should adopt these programs. But as as all competencies, we need competencies to start earlier. Developing competencies doesn't go with only one program or two programs, but it needs you you need to start competence development earlier in curriculum and then build on that uh, in, in the following years. So uh, the competencies that these programs were addressing, mostly all competencies that we have just mentioned were all uh, were, were, were all uh, uh, addressed in these programs. Uh, so some programs are focusing on pharmacotherapy only. Some programs are focusing on the attitudes and beliefs. Some of so uh, all, all the programs were addressing uh, different competencies. But we need to uh, make a mix of the, to, to assure that all these uh, competencies are shown by our students research was not mentioned was only the missing uh, maybe aspect in, the, in these programs uh, the main assessment tools that were used were mostly self subjective self-assessment tools that the learners uh, evaluate themselves using uh, scales so these scales are were usually um, uh, liquid scales or um, some uh, scales that were developed for the purpose of that research for specific research. So maybe sometimes the attitude, the, the uh, scales that were evaluating the attitudes of the learners towards suicide, uh, attitudes towards uh, suicide scale or attitudes toward depression or maybe uh, or uh, the attribution uh, questionnaire, uh, which was five liquid uh, scale. Uh, a five item uh, questionnaire or uh, willingness of patient of, of of learners to counsel patients with depression or schizophrenia also this was one of the uh, self assessment uh, tools that were uh, used so mainly self assessment tools were uh, were the main feature in uh, form of assessment in these uh, programs, but also there were uh, some also more objective ways such as role plays, vignette uh, cases, portfolios that were used in some uh, programs for evaluation of, of, of for assessment of learning and also some other observational uh, instruments uh, for communication uh, skills, for example, uh, that were uh, adopted in these uh, programs. These, the outcomes, the main outcomes that we were looking or that were evaluated were either attitudes uh, toward uh, care in this setting, uh, stigmatization, uh, knowledge of the patients or of the of the of the learners. Sorry, uh, so we we look at uh, we we give scales that will evaluate or uh, that will uh, assess how knowledgeable or how much the the students can. Uh, recall from uh, the knowledge that was delivered during uh, these uh, programs. Confidence was a, a, a very important parameter that was or, or an outcome that was assessed uh, throughout uh, these uh, programs, how much confidence you are or a, a learner is in delivering services for, for a specific group of, of, of patients uh, in, in this area. And also skills were also evaluated in these program so all these are outcomes that we should look when we are uh, structuring such a program now the the, the uh, programs that were um, carried in, in the fields of competency development for, for the sake of competency development in mental health involves uh, first aid uh, developmental first aid in mental health development programs. We had we we, we encounter anti stigmatization stigmatization uh, programs, anti suicide uh, programs, uh, uh, clinical rounds, 
uh, simulation of all uh, play-based programs or consumer uh, educators uh, were also uh, or consumer educators based programs so these programs we, we will have a person who uh, actually lived uh, or is currently experiencing a mental disorder so or currently receiving an ongoing treatment for mental disorder that will interact with the learners either in, in the hospital setting or in the in, in the uh, you know, uh, in the class so that uh, the, the students have real uh, experience also we had such we saw such uh, programs that were uh, carried so now i will uh, maybe uh, give further insights into uh, these uh, selected uh, programs. So we'll start with the uh, uh, mental health first aid programs. Now, mental health first aid programs, they are programs that provide individuals with uh, knowledge and skills that offer, that should be offered uh, for uh, initial help. So um, skills that are necessary include uh, how to manage crisis, crisis intervention, uh, skills, how to effectively respond in mental health uh, emergencies, uh, resolving, of course, mental health literacy, which is common, uh, um, how to, when to refer, when to, how to assess risks uh, or carry risk assessment uh, for uh, in emergency situations and know when the time that you have to refer uh, the patient to uh, a, a, a specialized healthcare provider. So these programs are not, so they say, doesn't mean that you, you will carry interventions uh, long-term interventions. These are uh, emergency uh, skills that we need or first uh, initial help that we should provide for uh, that that has a lot of meaning for, 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 for these patients and then refer uh, these patients to other healthcare providers. Uh, in these programs, we're focusing on uh, developing a non-judgmental approach uh, in our healthcare providers or future healthcare providers. They were using practical uh, scenarios, uh, self-assessment questionnaires were used for assessing uh, the uh, skills that are developed in, in, in this course, uh, and also self-care and, and resilience was also a target that these uh, programs um, were, were, were targeting. Um, these, these are the these are the most common uh, programs that we see in literature, the most commonly uh, adopted programs for uh, development of competency in mental health. Uh, but as we can see, uh, we, the, that uh, uh, such programs will not be uh, able to, uh, or a limitation of this program is that it could not be able to uh, address topics such as optimization of pharmacotherapy in these patients and uh, other further skills that you or competencies that we collaborative care that we uh, need to uh, show our graduates to show. So the second program is the anti-stigmatization intervention programs. From this, uh, for this, we uh, these are short, uh, sometimes short programs. So they are carried for uh, within a course. So it's not necessarily a, a full one semester. Uh, program, but this is two, one, or sometimes one hour or two uh, and a half hours intervention programs that are uh, carried within the courses. So for those of you who are delivering, giving the uh, courses of pharmaceutical care or uh, clinical pharmacy, pharmacotherapy, you may adopt such interventions in your uh, courses or in your programs. Uh, so these these courses, th these are interventions that included, the, uh, in, they include uh, presentations, videos, that live videos of people that uh, include uh, patients who are experiencing some mental health disorders and how healthcare providers will deal with these uh, patients. Discussions and active learning exercises are adopted in these programs. Uh, what, uh, the case that the, the the program that I would like to share with you, with you is the uh, program ca carried in Texas uh, Pharmacy Faculty of Pharmacy uh, that was evaluating the impact of an anti stigma uh, intervention on on pharmacy students. So this program was looking at the willingness of to counsel. How is what, what, what how, uh, evaluating this using a scale of two items that were uh, looking at how whether I the students or the learners are willing to uh, counsel patients with specific mental health uh, disorders like schizophrenia or 
depression and also as well uh, we were uh, diabetes was seen as a comparison used in, in this program so uh, these programs were uh, we have such uh, similar other interventions that were carried in other faculties so these are short programs they are up to they are focusing on stigmatization or attitudes behavior or, or attitudes that's why they are uh, short uh, and um, we can use also uh, confidence uh, in counseling of these patients or uh, was was also a parameter that was evaluated but was not positively affected in, in, in significantly affected in, in this uh, study um, we also have anti-suicide uh, intervention programs these programs they are also as well very uh, popular in literature, uh, and they are, it's the, the case that I, I would like to uh, share in this presentation is a, a program that was carried at the University of Tasmania in Australia. This, this was a five hours experiential uh, suicide uh, awareness uh, intervention program uh, that was uh, focusing on uh, developing knowledge and awareness about suicide related issues and students to develop skills for how to act in uh, and how to screen uh, suicide and provide the initial uh, support for these patients. So uh, this was a long term. The, the unique feature in this program is that it was also evaluating the long term impact of, of, of this program on the uh, students. Uh, so a pre-post evaluation of, of, of knowledge and skills and attitude was carried uh, in, in, in this program. This program was introduced in the first year students. So it was early adopted. It's also suitable for not only advanced uh, students in the advanced uh, years, but also can be, uh, it was implemented in the first year. Uh, students, again, uh, self-assessment uh, questionnaires were used to evaluate the outcomes of uh, this program. Um, also, we have uh, psychiatric uh, clinical rotations. I think this is uh, also uh, quite uh, common, in, uh, especially in PharmD programs. Uh, I, uh, this, the case that I'm sharing is from the United, again, uh, is from, uh, uh, from the United States. This is a five weeks elective advanced pharmacy practice experience uh, course. Uh, students were uh, for uh, for five weeks were staying or carrying this rotation before having this rotation. Of course, there is uh, didactic uh, teaching that's given. I think all schools of, or, or pharmacy or most commonly, um, most schools, let me say, of pharmacy deliver didactic uh, pharma, uh, psycho, uh, psychiatric uh, therapeutics in, uh, in pharmacotherapy, in their pharmacotherapy courses. So after these students were already exposed to these didactic courses, then they were advancing, they, they were practicing or enrolled to this course in the uh, advanced pharmacy practice uh, experiences. The students provided direct patient care, so in, in these clinics. So features of these programs include that these programs can be interprofessional. So they, they, they allow interprofessional uh, learning, interprofessional rounds will be adopted. Uh, be, be, students were practicing on counseling uh, with their preceptors. This was supervised by their preceptors. Um, group therapy sessions, they were attending group, group therapy sessions, they were evaluating or being capable to see medication efficacy and monitor their uh, tolerat tolerability in, 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 in patients. Electroconvulsive uh, therapy was usually uh, quite difficult to explain it, maybe in didactic courses were seen by these students or students were able to, to see these in, in, in their clinics, in the practice. Uh, so uh, these programs, this program is one of the, uh, I, I think, efficient programs. Now, uh, one of the uh, limitation of this program is that findings of, of this program were mixed in regards to uh, stigmatization of mental uh, of mentally ill uh, patients. So there was both uh, negative and uh, uh, outcomes that were coming from these programs. Similar uh, literature were also having some um, uh, mixed uh, findings. I, in my opinion, this is because 
the, the set, we, we said that we have a range of competencies or a cluster of competencies that we would like to develop in, the, in our students. So this cluster of competencies, if we don't uh, try to achieve, if we don't try to focus on uh, achieving uh, it with multiple programs, you cannot get all the outcomes from a single uh, program. I'm, 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 I was lucky to have this in to be enrolled in such an uh, experience in my undergraduates. Uh, I was. Uh, I, it is one of the clinical rotations that, frankly, uh, really impacted the way I, I, I address or, or see mental health from the start of my uh, career. Uh, how I deal with mental health, I mean, uh, patients with mental disorder, and also stigmatization. I'm after this program because I I was. Like um, uh, in co I have the co coincidence that uh, someone that I was really connected to a close friend that was just popped up to a clinic that I was at that time rotating in. So uh, and this colleague, this my this friend was uh, experiencing a mental health disorder for a long time. I was not familiar. I, I was not aware of this. But just when I came to the, when we encountered him in the clinic, then it made. Uh, me uh, get uh, first aware of this, how the symptoms, sometimes we, we we are not vigilant, we don't see the symptoms. And again, how this is very common and can affect all of us. So, so there's no need for stigmatization against these disorders because they are disorders that can affect everyone and we should be familiar with. Uh, lastly, uh, I, I would just like to say that to refer to some references. Uh, I think the, the systemic review carried by um, uh, Gonzalez uh, and, her, uh, and their colleagues was very uh, crafted, very well crafted and uh, would help anyone who would wish to develop a program. This can be a very good guide that you may start your work with. Also, uh, um, um, the handbook uh, or uh, mental health care uh, uh, handbook uh, that was developed by FIB, by a group of our colleagues, uh, uh, I, I, David Garden, uh, Haile Garten, uh, Sarira Adin, which uh, and also uh, our uh, one of our uh, guests in the uh, panel that uh, the, the, this is a very good handbook that also can be helpful uh, in, in, in as a resource that you may start. Uh, and also all these colleagues uh, are uh, good people that you may collaborate with. Uh, I think we need, this is an area that needs uh, collaboration, especially in, uh, as uh, as for uh, between us as educators in developing uh, these uh, programs. So collaborating with all these names that I have just mentioned or uh, text or uh, references that I have uh, uh, is always a, a good start to uh, develop these programs. Uh, that's all what I would like to share. Now, there is some programs that were not mentioned in this literature. We invited some Co uh, so colleagues that will go are going to uh, share all their personal experience with developing programs that were develop that were aiming to develop competency in mental health uh, in in the uh, coming panel uh, to share with so them to share with us their experiences. Uh, back to Arinola. Thank you so very much, um, Abdi. Excellent presentation and a lot of um, a lot of nuggets. Have been released to us on um, research in mental health, planning, uh, planning how to develop competences in our students, and even in in pra uh, practicing pharmacists. Thank you very much uh, for those of us asking questions about the the presentation. The present the webinar, the entire webinar, including the presentation, will be on the FIP Digital Events uh, website, so you can access it there again and again and again. For your pleasure, for your pleasure and your own personal development. So moving on in the program, we have a panel discussion on challenges and opportunities in implementing programs of capacity building in mental health services. And I will quickly um, introduce our three panelists. Next slide, Abdi. <clears throat> our first panelist, uh, and, and this is in no particular order, Dr. Sarah Kamis, who is an assistant professor in clinical pharmacy from the Gerash University Faculty of Pharmacy. She's um, a patient care orientation pharmacist with a PhD degree in clinical pharmacy and five years experience in teaching. She has a professional interest and orientation at quality of the curriculum audit, improvement of teaching strategies according to the new ever-changing world and transferring students from a receiver learner to self-directed lifelong learner by developing their continuing professional skills. Dr. Kamis, you are very welcome. Next slide. 
Uh, second panelist, Dr. Odiam Dr. David Odiambo, is the cur is a curator with the African Pharmaceutical Network, working to bring together pharmaceutical players in Africa for knowledge sharing, policy shaping, and innovation. He is a board member and honorary treasurer of the Kenya Association of Pharmaceutical Industry membership organization that represents the biopharmaceutical companies that through research invent and develop innovative life-saving medicines. He's a co-founder of Rye, Rye Culture Health and Social Innovation, a social enterprise working with young people to tackle global health challenges in local communities in Kenya through training, upskilling, and project management. He's also a regulatory affairs manager at Novartis based in Kenya, and was awarded the FIP Community Pharmacy Section 2021 Champion for Change and Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, Young Pharmacist of the Year in 2021. Dr. Odiambu, you are welcome. And then the last panelist, just getting the introductions out of the way, is Dr. Anisha Sandu, an assistant lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, Monash University in Malaysia. She's the lead for the Interprofessional Education and Monash Model of Care portfolios for the school. She was awarded Excellence in Education Commendations for Outstanding Educator in 2020 and Teaching Excellence in 2021. Our research interests include pharmacy practice, primary care, pharmacy education, interprofessional education, and digital health. And she has experiences in medication therapy management, patient communication, implementing quality improvement projects for pharmacy services in hospital-based medication safety initiatives. She, has, she serves multiple roles within the FIP, via the FIP Young Pharmacist Group, the FIP Workforce Development Hub, and the FIP eHealth and Digital Health Policies Committee. You are all very welcome. You know, so um, I believe I have, the three of them are with me online right now. And I will just take you uh, one by one to share your um, experiences in terms of challenges and opportunities of programs. Uh, for capacity building in mental health. Dr. Kam, it's over to you. Thank you so much for your intro uh, introduction and thank you for this informative uh, webinar and presentations. For my experience, I had done a simulated continuing professional development course on maintaining the pharmacy students' mental health as we believe that continuing the professional development skills is the way to, to know and to learn every, uh, new, if, every new things we need in our life. Uh, where we apply this uh, program with this five, uh, fifth year uh, pharmacy students. Uh, with, uh, we give them a course about the mental health and teach them how to apply the CBD uh, cycle to improve their awareness about mental health. And before we apply the course, we gave them a survey, self-administrated uh, uh, survey to assist their mental health. And after get, uh, finishing this course, we uh, gave them the survey again. We noticed how the their awareness about mental health uh, uh, was developed. Uh, yeah, we haven't seen uh, significant differences in their mental health. However, their skills uh, in uh, as a pharmacist to uh, improve the, uh, the community services was better than be before. Uh, yeah. This is the main things about our program. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Kamis. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a few questions for you in the chat box as we move on. Uh, Dr. David Odiambo, over to you. Thank you so much, Anola. Thank you for all being here with us. So in terms of experiences, some of the observations that we have I've seen in terms of my work in mental health, and I feel in multiple organizations in different fronts, with a focus on improving access to mental health care services, and also supporting people who are able to deliver these services. One of the key bills that I think we need to be cognizant of as pharmacies is the fact that 
mental health services and mental health care has been more focused on the clinical perspective and therefore even when you look at resources when you're developing context and i'm glad that you're part of the work the team that developed the workbook we now moved it from being more clinical where we are seeing just care in the hospital setting how do we offer mental health services in the communities where we are practicing and where we are engaging with people on a daily basis and i think these are perspectives that we need to mainstream and ensure that they're sustainable they are long term in terms of the impact of what they're doing and those are perspectives of what key needs to be done the other bit that is very critical for us to acknowledge is that as much as pharmacy and pharmacy practices and involved most of the societies and even among our pharmacies ourselves we've already to a greater extent been believing that our role is closely and actually directly linked to medicines and medicine medical products and in that perspective then you don't always consider yourself as an expert on medicines and being an expert on medicine you're not looking at what are the other funneling capabilities that you could have before you prescribe in most countries pharmacies are not allowed to diagnose and prescribe you are only offer the medical information but the medical information can only be offered to somebody who has been diagnosed and there's a prescription in place so your contribution and your role would be am i able to sign for and refer somebody to the care that they need to a physician to a neurologist neurologist or psychiatrist then beyond that then you're able to collaboratively engage with that care pathway and i think when as pharmacists within ourselves we need to acknowledge that our role goes beyond the medicines only but it has an integral component at the medicines phase but linking it from the different facets as it is on the other bit as pharmacists as much as we are doing a lot of advocacy work let us advocate for mental health but as we advocate for mental health let us sensitize the public that as pharmacists we are at a vantage position and we are closer to them and willing to offer the services and when you're talking about competencies and experiential practice you learn much by offering services that people are consuming what if you're working in a community pharmacy that nobody comes to seek guidance around mental health services you will never practice in that domain if you're not practicing in that domain you're not able to apply your skills and your competencies and your knowledge in serving them so our advocacy beyond creating awareness should be able to be able to enlighten them to know that we are here to support you we're here to walk the journey with you to make you better to get help you attain your positive healthcare outcomes and in that case we'll have more people seeking care from pharmacies and therefore pharmacies could actually get more position in the care domains and those are some of the things that will also impact the kind of capacity building that we offer if nobody needs a service from me i would not want to learn about it and if i'm not learning about it then i want to be competent i think those are some of the conversation we need to look at as well thank you thank you so very much um uh, david uh, over to you anisha uh thanks very much so essentially i think we've had a lot of discussion today about how mental health and well-being is a priority for patient care and that we need to build a health workforce that's competent to deal with patients requiring that care and generally i think when we look at literature as well we tend to see competencies within healthcare settings to revolve around the ability of a healthcare professional to balance both work related demands as well as patient assessment when it comes to patient assessment we're looking at things like history taking decision making communication um but the ability for healthcare professionals to actually manage work related demands that's become a lot more apparent nowadays as a focus area in capacity building um and i think when we look at you know some of the literature that we are also releasing from the international pharmaceutical federation so for example our global competency um framework so we have the fip a uh, global competency framework um we find that you know we're also really highlighting the importance of recognizing professional skills such as the need to self regulate recognize our limits recognize that we are affected by setbacks or stress the need to cultivate resilience to develop effective coping strategies for challenging workplace situations so i guess my work and research i look primarily into cultivating resilience in undergraduate pharmacy students and this is really something that's in line with um the international pharmaceutical federation our development goals one which is on academic capacity and two that's on early career training strategy um and what we're really looking to do here is to really transform our global pharmacy workforce to meet challenges in the future and this really started interesting me because i found that during the covid-19 um pandemic we started to see that healthcare professionals had very intense workloads and what we started to see is that early career pharmacists and pharmacy students may also be uh, vulnerable to mental and emotional pressure when they enter the workforce especially in this 
healthcare environment that we're um, experiencing right now. And so that's why it's so important for us to actually take careful consideration into thinking about developing um, better ability for them to reflect on coping strategies, to provide better psychological support mechanisms. And when we look at you know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, this is also in line with goals three and four, which we look at you know, the mental well-being of all, as well as providing good quality education. So what I started to look at, and that's also something that I'm very grateful to the FIPA CPS for providing me um, a grant for as well, is to look at you know, how, how can we actually improve um, the ability for our students to develop and cultivate resilience so that when they go out into the healthcare workforce, they are able to provide better uh, patient care to, to patients that require it. Because um, how do we provide competent services in ensuring well-being of our patients if we ourselves are suffering from the effects of burnout and stress? Um, where I'm at, particularly, I'm in Malaysia, and mental health support in Malaysia is generally limited, um, with a lack of formalized programs um, available for students and even patients to access. So I will acknowledge that there is a growing interest now um, in integrating things like self-regulation and resilience into our healthcare curriculums. Um, but this is still a field that needs a lot more study and evaluation. So we're really looking into you know, more resilience-based activities in pharmacy education programs, we're looking to help to aid pharmacy students um, who are vulnerable to academic stress, uh, who lack with coping strategies, um, and you know, trying to think about ways to introduce relevant programs, relevant tools or initiatives for these students to use, not just in their personal development, but to learn how to reflect and self-assess on individual strengths, weaknesses, especially when they face challenging situations. So this way they can develop resilience. I think the further questions are actually go on a little bit more into um, explaining what are some of these programs and initiatives that we have carried out. Uh, yeah, thanks, Harinola. Thank you very much. Over to you, Abdi. Yes. So uh, okay. So uh, thank you so much. So I, I, I guess all all our uh, panelists they had some uh, a unique experience in in developing uh, competency in this area. Uh, I think uh, David was uh, working with uh, pharmacists, so already practitioners. Uh, and he had a very interesting uh, study that uh, and, and outcomes that he came from his uh, research, as well uh, Anisha and uh, Sarah both were uh, also uh, having a wind uh, a research grant for developing uh, programs that were targeting the science and mental health competency development in students. So I, I would like to ask you all uh, in this round, uh, what were the main challenges from the start, from day one that you encountered when you were carrying your uh, programs or developing your programs? What were the main challenges that you have encountered, the main obstacles you, are, you have encountered, and how did you address these, or uh, if, uh, how did you uh, address these uh, obstacles or challenges? Also, we have, uh, I think, uh, our chairs, uh, Ari, uh, uh, Dr. Ariana and uh, uh, the, uh, Professor Arinola also both are also uh, experienced with developing such programs. So maybe also they will jump later in uh, to also uh, uh, address these talents. How to how how would they also advise to meet these talents? So um, uh, shall we start with uh, David first? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Abdi. I think when you look at it from the challenges that we've engaged with in most of the cases, dealing with building programs and the execution on these particular programs, the first thing is in terms of access to the resources. Most resources that we've been able to access were not contextualized and actually purpose for the pharmacy community. And therefore, it means you're using already existing resources for other faculties and other cadres of practice, and then you have to contextualize them based on your local need and put it into practice. That has been a critical bit of it. And the other bit for me, in a context where they, but we all acknowledge that mental health has not taken forefront in terms of health access and health priorities uh, compared to infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases, other non-communicable diseases in that particular perspective. And with that, then it means also in terms of financial resourcing and budgetary provisions for such kind of mental health services have not been there. And if that financing is not there, then it means even for the internal projects and programs that you're doing, 
we have to look for alternative financing mechanisms and alternative sources. I'll give you an example for the work that we do within the culture, health, and social innovation and mental health, working with young people, the Mental Health Youth Champions Network. Most of it is dependent on me being able to have a full-time job with Novartis, where I use some of my resources to initiate and actually support these youth-led programs and engagements in the local communities. By the virtue of doing that, we're generating contextualized and specific evidence on what impact can we make in our local communities? What challenges are existing there that we need to address? So those kind of financing, but at the end of the day, one of the key things that gives us the motivation and the confidence is that if I'm able to raise these resources, do this work and we generate the evidence of the impact of this work in the local communities, there will be imperative for the local policy change to happen. With a change in policy, there will be a need for investment in mental health services. That investment will mean in the next five or 10 years, another David coming in to support mental health access interventions and programs in the community will not start from a point of where there are limited resources and there's actually almost non existent budgetary provision from the government or other stakeholders. There will be, we will have moved one step ahead of the curve. And that is a critical bit of what we are hoping would be a success and that is going to take forward. The other bit, another challenge they're looking at is. For me as a pharmacist and working in the pharmacy space, I'm asking myself, how do we as pharmacists take leadership? We can only take leadership when we are in the forefront and actually willing to learn and willing to apply ourselves. I would give you an example in this case in terms of the work that we're doing on laundry culture, but also the other work that we're doing within African Pharmaceutical Network, where we've designed the community pharmacy partnership with a focus on working with community pharmacies to improve access to mental health services in the local communities. Most of the people who are taking up these programs from agriculture, young people, very few of them are pharmacists. For the community pharmacy programs, you find actually there are more pharmaceutical technologists who are taking up than the actual pharmacists with the degree holders. So how do we encourage more pharmacists to get into the space? Probably it's the awareness aspect. And without that awareness component, how do we drive that? And actually that is one of the conversations that most of my engagement even within the pharmacy networks I try to bring people to conversation. Let's just talk about mental health. What will be our role? And by stimulating this conversation in our own local spaces, we are evoking interest. And when there's interest, now you can channel them to where they get the capacity building and training opportunities to be able to apply themselves and offer the services. And those are some of the jobs that we have been having and also some of the intervention that we're trying to put forward with the hope that in the next five, 10 years, we want to be starting from where we are but we'll have moved a step forward. And I'm glad that actually we got the opportunity to contribute to the FIP Mental Health Workbook because that serves now as a guide. When I was talking about not having resources, now we have resources. How do we contextualize and make it work in our own local countries with a focus on improving mental health services? Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, David. Uh, so I, I think maybe uh, later Ariana will have a comment on that, how to motivate pharmacists. I think uh, she has some, she, uh, she was involved with some work uh, related with that. But first, let me ask Sarah. So Sarah, uh, you have used a very unique methodology to develop competency in mental health, uh, which was different than literature that we have so far uh, encountered. You were adapting uh, a, a lifelong learning through lifelong learning uh, or, or, comp or uh, continuous professional development. In undergraduate classes, you are trying to build competency through reflective practices and portfolios. Uh, can you tell us what was the main, uh, most important challenges that you have encountered and uh, the, 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 how 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 you 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 address these challenges or, uh, or 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 those that are not addressed that you would wish our experts also to maybe to comment on? Yes, Sarah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, in the university and uh, term, there was no time, no enough time for us to uh, to have the course uh, for two semesters. We. We, we, uh, we were limited for only five weeks. That was not enough for the students. Also, the, the credit hours of the uh, syllabus in the university, it's not included a topic uh, about mental health. So we, uh, we make it as an elective course. Uh, I wish many students uh, were able to join us, but there were only like 10 students. 
Uh, the second thing also uh, the awareness of the importance of this pharmacist role in the enhancing the uh, ser uh, mental health service was not that much helping us because uh, I did we didn't find enough uh, references and information about the role of a clinical pharmacist. The roles was uh, concerned about the therapeutics and the medication of the uh, patient and our role as a pharmacist. But there were not, uh, there were, there were not any uh, study explaining the skills and the competencies that pharmacists and the students need to, uh, to apply their roles in the, in the uh, helping people with mental health. Uh, also, uh, the misunderstanding from the student to the uh, mental health disorders, uh, they get confused be between uh, depression with uh, stress with anxiety, and they, they were acting uh, the same thing in all diseases. They don't know how to communicate with the patient who has mental health. Uh, the lack of information and the, the lack of knowledge uh, in the student about the importance uh, of the good and effective communication with the uh, mental health patients. Uh, uh, okay, also the stigma between the students themselves and they believe that the, the community will not ask them uh, for help they can only the, dispense the medication to the patients uh, and they cannot give enough uh, advices for the patient because they thought they will hurt the patient because the stigma. Uh, also the uh, collaboration with other health professionals, uh, we couldn't get enough collaboration. We uh, had uh, a professional about mental health, but we uh, wished we can, we were able to go to the hospital and do a rotation to uh, contact the patient face to face to enhance the skills about uh, the, the, the skills of the students. Okay. Uh, yeah, these are okay. the most important okay. Okay. obstacles. So, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. I, I, I guess now regarding the resources, now we are at that time, I think you were carrying the study, the handbook was not out, but now I, I think the, 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 the handbook that uh, we, of, uh, that was developed by FIB can be a very good uh, guide now for what are the services that or competencies that we should develop our uh, pharmacist in. But uh, same with David. Also, David was uh, mentioning that there is a lack of motivation in the community pharmacist. Now, you are also uh, expressing that also the students are, there was when, when these courses are left uh, uh, elective, the students were not also coming, attending, or choosing these courses because maybe they are not perceiving these as, as, as an important competency. So I think this uh, um, there, there, there is multiple ways of addressing this. Also, the range of skills. So you, you were trying to develop all the competencies with one course also. That's why maybe you find that there is communication. There was the barrier of stigmatization already present to the students. Lack of uh, maybe uh, uh, well uh, orientation in optimization of, of, of the antipsychotics. So maybe... Creating so this could be a good taking a message that we take from this, which is that we we need to develop this competence. You need a range of programs. No, you don't just address it with one program, then it will solve everything. You need through the curriculum to develop uh, these competencies, competency by one, at, and feed these competencies throughout the curriculum so that to develop this competency. Uh, let me give to uh, Anisha. Anisha has also uh, has a, a program that was uh, she was awarded for, uh, which was uh, on, on developing resilience uh, in, in, in both undergraduates. Also, she was studying peace in the uh, practitioners. And, and Anisha, can you share with us the main challenges that you have encountered as well? It's actually really interesting because um, as I've worked through some of my research in this area, um, I actually find that exactly what you just said, that we really probably need a curriculum that spans through 
you know, all the years in different ways to really instill these sorts of competencies in our pharmacy graduates. So um, just to give a bit of context, so the first project, which is the one that I got funded from, from FIP, was to uh, teach and develop a module um, to kind of increase awareness of resilience in graduating pharmacy students. Um, and this was something that I carried out uh, over the past two years. Um, and in terms of, you know, challenges that we found when, when it came to developing this program, you know, firstly, it's the fact that even us ourselves as educators, we, we ourselves need to really upskill and to know how to actually teach these sorts of concepts to students to really kind of understand how we can get them to, um, to you know, kind of create the activities that will actually help them to cultivate these sorts of practices. Um, so that was probably, you know, one of the first challenges that we had, which was, you know, um, myself, uh, when I first implemented this module, the first round, um, we didn't find that that was, the, that we made much of an impact in the students per se, only about 60% of the students found it useful. Um, only 30% of them felt that the activities that were designed helped us to actually achieve our learning outcomes. And so what we actually did was then we went to, you know, an expert panel made up of clinical psychologists, made up of, you know, pharmacy educators, kind of uh, ran through our activities with them, got their feedback, you know, re re-strategized everything. We sort of started to provide more theoretical teaching to the students, um, came up with more uh, small group-based activities, activities that helped them to kind of share better so they could learn from each other better. But, you know, we use more problem-based learning so that um, they could kind of also understand the kind of scenarios that they might actually face in their workplace, um, you know, because these are some things that they, they probably have had not much exposure to apart from their placements that they would have had in um, hospitals and clinics. So after doing all of that and re-implementing the module, we saw a huge difference. Suddenly it was about 95% of students that found it useful, that found it really helped them. Um, you know, about 85% saw that it was actually activities that would help achieve the learning outcomes. Um, and then we had qualitative feedback as well, that they found these types of workshops, teaching them these sorts of skills to be very useful because it helps them to be more ready and mentally well prepared to face challenges in the future. So I decided to go one step further. I decided, okay, maybe, you know, what kind of tools can we introduce in our syllabus to help students to cultivate resilience better? So my next project was to look into uh, incorporating resilience diaries. So I started with a small group of students, second year pharmacy students, and I thought, okay, let's um, give them resilience diaries because uh, literature shows that things like journaling helps you to kind of process difficult or challenging situations a lot better. So you learn to cope with them better the next round. And so you um, you you actually, uh, you know, develop that awareness and that resilience towards that type of situation. Um, now, unfortunately, I found the same situation that Sarah did, which is, you know, in this kind of case, because it requires so much self-motivation, it requires the students to drive themselves into taking up this habit, it only appealed to a very small section of students. There are only a very small section of students who feel like habits like journaling make them more centered, helps them to identify themselves deeper, to learn about themselves better, how they can control their reactions better to similar situations. But most students are the same thing, no time, no energy, I don't get marks from it, why should I bother? You know, that sort of situation. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's, you know, that's how it is. Um, so then this led to the thought of, you know, how do we incorporate resilience learning better for our students? And how can it be in a manner that it fits sort of seamlessly into their degree program? And so this is, you know, where the third initiative has come about. And this is spearheaded by um, Dr. Betty Exintaris, Dr. Nurushi Karinaratne, Prof. Kirsty Galbraith, and myself, where we're actually looking to creating a resilience curriculum that spans through all four years of the student's undergraduate degree, because what we do in Monash is we have this skills coaching program where we have about 10 to 14 students um, that are uh, assigned to a mentor or a coach, which is, you know, an academic led program. So us as academics, we are in charge of about 10 to 14 students. We check in with them about 10 times in the first year and then six times um, in all their subsequent years through the degree. So we take this opportunity to, to develop professional skills with them, things like reflective practice, communication, integrity, empathy, um, by giving them a lot of scenarios, discussing, you know, having the chance to build the skills as well as to build action plans so that they can develop those skills further. So we've decided now to kind of use this as a good 
platform or a, or a board for us to actually incorporate resilience cultivation um, by getting them to annually kind of have a resilience based session as well, in addition to you know several workshops that they will also have throughout their degree years. So this is something that's you know currently um, being rolled out. And so we haven't evaluated it yet, but I'm really looking forward to learn more and to see the results of this third initiative. Great. Uh, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, that, that, that was uh, that was really, really great. Uh, you have we, I, I, the message I get from there is that we have to be patient and and we have to approach this stepwise, not just uh, with give up from the first uh, program. Uh, so also uh, Anisha was also maybe indicating to the grant that the projects were also granted. So uh, maybe this will be an answer for David for the challenge that David bring up that FIP is also providing some seed funding it's, uh, for, for it's a unique uh, research. So for those of you who are uh, not uh, familiar with FIP. This is a this is a, if I will provide these such opportunities for developing, uh, uh, carrying such uh, research uh, uh, for uh, spe in spe specialized area. The academic session is bo was providing this. So uh, if any educators, we're calling you to join the academic session or FIP come members uh, so that you get also an opportunity to 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 get such uh, support for such uh, uh, exceptional or. or leading projects. Uh, so, uh, Alena, will you take on the advice, the, yes. the last round of uh, yes, comments uh, from chairs? Had, and mm -hmm. um, We had also one uh, comment in the checkbox uh, regarding uh, uh, mental health uh, services provided by pharmacists in the terms that uh, we need to do more on the global level, so to, uh, that we need to address more this uh, type of services. So, Maybe if uh, we can have, uh, if we can have uh, just a short um, discussion about uh, different opportunities for collaboration, but also to improvement of these type of uh, mental health services, especially in the community pharmacy. So maybe if, uh, Dr. Odiampo David will try to answer this question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. So for me, when you look at it in terms of collaborative practices within the community pharmacy setting, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So collaborative practices within the community pharmacy would start from a point of us as pharmacists working in the community pharmacy section, understanding what is the scope of our role and scoping our services. In terms of the work, and I think you, you did a great presentation on that as well, Elena, in terms of your initial slide deck because we started from offering services, the counseling services and all that, the signposting referral to care pathways and having collaborative engagements where if I'm in a pharmacy and let's say, for example, mom Abdi comes to me and he needs mental health services, I'll offer the psychosocial counseling at the initial phase, but when I feel like in terms of the tiring and the grading of the care, there's need for better care, then a specialized care and refer him to a facility. From that facility, if at all he has to be diagnosed and actually prescriptions are written for him, he needs to be able to continue the management, but in between considering most of our specialist clinics are standard in terms of maybe a month, two months down the line for continued monitoring. The pharmacy will always at the, at the community pharmacy level with no clear need for booking appointments. You need to be able to come back. What can the role of the pharmacy be in terms of monitoring and following up on that care? Then beyond that, now seeing if at all this, let's say, for example, it's a condition that can resolve and therefore you don't have to stop taking your medication. How do we ensure that actually the tapering down of the dose and actually weaning you off the medication can be supported by the community pharmacy in your local context? And the other bit in the collaborative setting beyond just working and scoping your services, looking at other cadres of professional that you need to work with, you need to ask yourself, how does our healthcare service delivery system work? It works in a healthcare system where you need a financing component, you need the adoption of digital technologies. How do you integrate the digital technologies in your platform? Do you, do you create a community where people can engage? The communities of wellness, and I see there's actually a group that I'm part of in the local context, where people just have chats on mental health in a WhatsApp group. 
But as much as people are sharing their experiences, people feel a sense of belonging and sense of social connection that is helping them. How can we lead as experts where when some comments and sentiments are shared which are not scientifically sound, you're able to step in and by the virtue of being a professional, you have the authority to give additional guidance and they consider that valuable. And therefore you're able to drive that conversation. Then after knowing the quality of care and the impact of it, how do you engage with financing institutions? How do you help them to be actually able to see I need to be able to rebate and reoffer the payments for these services? Because one of the reasons I will tell you for a fact for some of the pharmacies who are not keen on being part of the program is who pays for these additional services? For the medicine, somebody will pay and even maybe insurance covers will be able to will be compensate for that but they reimburse the payment. So what of payments are there for the services? And it's about looking at additional partners and the stakeholders beyond the conventional ones to be able to serve our communities. And the collaboration also comes in generating evidence. And I think one of the key bits that we're trying to push for, and you look at the matrix of the work we're doing in the Africa Pharmaceutical Network, knowledge sharing and capability building, looking at the policy interface and the innovative business models, because in all that component, we need academic institution to generate the new evidence and new research and build capabilities. Then these new experience and best practices need to inform policies. The policies create an enabling practice environment for the professional, but also for the investor and the business community to be able to offer the services to the people who need them. So that David, is David, critical. Yeah. David, I think uh, your final words are just leading us to our conclusion. Mm -hmm. I know in the good company, always time is passing too quickly, but we have just one more minute to conclude. My job would be now to thank all of you uh, who have been working hard in the, in the previous months to prepare these excellent presentations and panel discussion. I would like to encourage you all to continue with your great work. And I would also like to remind all of us that we are here in service of the humankind and always to think about the end in our mind when we talk about education, and this is the patient. I think organizing public health campaigns, uh, professors and students going together to the on-site meeting people with the health issues is the key. Uh, not to run away from them, not to be afraid to ask the questions as well for the practitioners. And I think while we are in the practice, either in the academia, we need to be role models that people can follow. With these thoughts, I would like to conclude because it's uh, just the really very end of the webinar. Thanks very much. Um, Arinola, any conclusion words from your side still? No, just to say thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we hope to see you next time. And also one apologies for everyone that we were removing the date of this webinar. It was impossible to follow the, the previous date. So thank you very much for your patience and that you are still with us today. Uh, great job, team. Um, let's do our work and let's keep on going with the promoting, developing competences in the mental care for the patients. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.